One approach to addressing such an august group as this is to have a big opening, an opening that is replete with images, perhaps edgy, maybe controversial, an opening that might create tension within the audience. Then the presenter can take the minutes that remain to reduce that tension and to explain what he or she really meant by the opening. So here is my opening. Here is what I believe about the future of schools. I believe that schools are, and future schools will continue to be, the most amazing places on earth. This is true because they're filled with the most dedicated people, the most intelligent people, the most loving people on earth. They're filled with administrators, staff, teachers, and students, all dedicated to developing themselves and dedicated to making this a better world. Okay, that's what I believe about the future of schools. Uh, it certainly was not edgy. It certainly was not controversial. I don't think I created any tension in this group, but it did have some images. You gotta make, give me credit for that. What it is, is my statement of my love for education and for schools. The problem is, my opening statement leads nowhere for me. Because if schools are great, and if schools are gonna to continue to be great, then why change them? But let me offer three things to you, and maybe I can get myself back on track. First of all, I have absolutely no idea what schools will look like in the next five to 10 to 15 years. I don't think anybody does. Secondly, schools need to make dramatic changes. As much as I love them, schools have to change, and they need to change with some dispatch. If adults don't change schools, kids will. The reality is, kids have already changed your schools. You just don't see it because you don't know what to look for. Thirdly, how in the world do you change this thing called schools? They're so massive, they're so huge. They're in motion, they're in place. You know, until very recently, I did not have a clue about how even to address this change process. But now I have a clue. Two weeks ago, I was having lunch with one of my doctoral students. His name is Tim Magner. And Tim has had some very important positions in technology and policy in Washington, D.C. and other cities. I'm chairing his dissertation, and we were talking about his dissertation. We both agreed that we love schools. We both agreed that schools need to change. And we're talking about his dissertation. Then out of nowhere, apropos of nothing, Tim says, you know, Jack, what we need to do is change the metaphor, not the schools. If we get the metaphors right, the schools can change themselves. And I said, Tim, what do you think is the biggest metaphor of schools right now? And he said, it's the production line industrial model. No doubt about that in my mind. And I said, you know, I'll go back a century before that and say, I think it's the agrarian model. And we're not going to dwell on that here today because those have been discussed already. Let me now talk about the nature of metaphors. Metaphors are powerful figures of speech. They join with similes to create images that define lives and define behavior. A metaphor is a figure of speech that compares two objects and in so doing, gives the receiving object all of the characteristic of the donor object. You said, Jack, surely you have an example of this. Yes, I do. I have an example from my favorite poet from the state of Massachusetts, Emily Dickinson. When I was a freshman or sophomore in high school, I read the poem, There Is No Frigate Like a Book. And after I figured out what that really meant, I was liberated. Emily Dickinson, through a one line of poetry, took all of the characteristics of a frigate, the ocean-going vessel of the time, and put those characteristics on top of a book. And I could go and read and travel anywhere I wanted in the world. It freed me. I could go anywhere and no one could stop me. I didn't need a ship. All I needed was a book. Now that is a simile. There is no frigate like a book. Let me compare a simile with a metaphor so you know what we're talking about and then jump back into metaphors. My brother called me several years ago. My brother Richard, who is the Franciscan monk who runs the Santa Barbara mission. He said, Jack, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, it's a serious question. I said, come on, come on, what's the problem? He said, my younger brother, he said, Jack, are you becoming more and more like dad? 
Now that's a simile. And I said, Rich, your phone call came much too late. I am dead. Now that is a metaphor. And so I talked to Tim. I said, you know, Tim, we've talked about what the metaphors are. What would your metaphor be if we could have any me metaphor we wanted for schools? And he said, Jack, I would make it a research laboratory where a kid comes to school every day working on one or two or three or four projects. And he maybe comes to school as a, as a junior researcher. And what he does is works with other researchers who could be older students in the school, and then senior researchers, maybe professors or college professors or perhaps school teachers, third grade teachers. It doesn't matter what grade level. And your teacher now becomes your senior scientist working with you. And what this person can do is open up the world to you and connect you with scientists around the world. They can connect you with your community. And the role of the teacher changes here as a colleague and not the sage on the stage becomes the person who works with you to develop your own self. The focus now is on the kid. Now there's some implications of this. A lot of technology is going to be needed. We're going to have to have a lot of spaces, and we'll talk about that in a second. And he said, Jack, what is your model? And I said, you know, mine's a little bit younger, older than yours. It's about 500 years older. I see it as a medieval guild situation where you have a master and an apprentice, where kids study and they learn under the guidance of a master. And the master could be a teacher, could be several teachers and you work together. And the kid is given every opportunity to learn skills that he or she needs to learn. And they can be mathematics, science, it doesn't matter. Now you say to me, Jack, budget concerns here. If you say the kids should have access to every single technology that they need, how are schools gonna pay for that? And I know that. But who says that school has to take place in this place that we call school? If you're studying aerospace and astrophysics, why not work over in an aerospace corporation? Why not go with a group of kids and spend part of your day over there? And if you want to deal with biological problems and deal with, with food distribution, find out why 30 to 40% of all good products never make it to market, why don't you work at a supermarket and then get on a bus and go out to a farm and study the problem of distribution? Why don't you go to a bakery? Why don't you go to a restaurant to learn the mathematics of baking and the art of cooking. Who says you have to be in school anymore? There are other models out there. Those would include your shopping mall. Now that kids are in charge, kids go to shopping mall to buy a pair of jeans. They compare prices, they compare styles, they compare fit. They're in charge. If you use that as a metaphor for your school, the kids are gonna come to you and say, okay, what do you have to offer? That's an interesting metaphor. A fourth metaphor could be rocket ship Earth, where kids from multiple countries get together to save the planet. And they work in teams with multiple languages, multiple goals, multiple cultures. That metaphor of rocket ship Earth intrigues me. Why can't we get kids from countries who are fighting now to start working together? It's been my contention since 1976 when I tried to communicate American kids with Russian kids. If you're speaking to somebody, you're probably not going to bomb them. What is my mission today? My mission today is this. I'm asking each one of you to get involved in defining the metaphor for your school. There are about 100,000 schools in this country. Two-thirds of them are elementary, one-third high school. Pick out one. Pick out one that you're involved with and help define the metaphor for your school. First of all, who should get involved? I say everybody. Start with the superintendent, the school board, the administration, the staff, teachers. Get taxpayers, get residents, get experts, get consultants. But whatever you do, please, please, please involve the kids. The kids know what the school should look like. They just don't tell you because they're not sure you want to know. Now, how do you do this? This is the tricky part. This is the process part. There are a lot of mechanisms out there to do it. And they include town hall meetings. They include focus groups. They include surveys. They include all kinds of social interaction. But I would suggest that you consider social media as a way to bring this whole thing together. Consider Facebook to bring people to your website. Consider LinkedIn with its groups to have people talk about common subjects. Look at Twitter. Twitter has a lot of power. 
Develop a hash code group. Hey, it worked in Egypt. Hash code Jan 25 is why Egypt now is going to be a democracy. Work with Google Plus. Get birds of a feather groups. And get birds of a non-feather, that's the concept, and have people with different opinions get together in Google Plus. Take a look at YouTube and put out videos and advertise. Develop blogs. There are a lot of things you can do in social media that are going to improve your process. And so I conclude with this. What is my message? There's going to be a subtle revolution of the metaphor. It's a revolution that's going to be led by kids of all ages. It's a revolution that will succeed. And when it succeeds, we will see the golden age of education in the United States. Thank you.